Welcome. I know that so far, you, you know, you hear that really nice. The music was fantastic and the kids up here, great. Uh, but all you really know about me so far is that I'm attractive. That's all you really, you know, have to go on. So maybe that's enough. I'm kind of kidding. That didn't really go over so well from the distance. But <clears throat> we, have a, we have a theme going in the Luke 5 passage that we read tonight. You've been reading it. It's the theme throughout this entire conference. It's in this beautiful painting up here from the end of the book of John. And that theme is having to do with water. Jesus was around water a lot. And Jesus uses what happens with water a lot. I have recently resigned and retired from being a pastor for the last five years or so down in Southern California. Sorry, California again. Yeah, Mission Field, uh, Newport <laughs> Beach. Um, but I, I retired back in, uh, in November and just now starting to get my bearings. We're living in our family home uh, that we've had for a long time in Gig Harbor, Washington. So I'm back in the Northwest, loving it, being around five grandchildren. Uh, who are legitimately also attractive, all five and younger. But in the, in the Northwest, as you know, if you're around water at all, especially where the ocean kind of connects and ends up being kind of going into the tidelands, the Columbia River, for example, and where we live up in Gig Harbor, we are literally surrounded by the Puget Sound. And there, that my Southern California friends never could figure out or understand, there's massive tidal change up in the Pacific Northwest that is so different from Southern California and anything going further south toward the equator. What happens is that, as you know, is that there is a tidal shift that is, at one point, there's a whole lot of water that just comes kind of screaming in. It's called a flood tide. And then as the tide shifts, it ebbs, it leaves, so you have this movement of water. And at the time when the, the shift is going from flood tide to ebb tide, that's what we call a slack tide. Now, people that actually observe what's going on and take a look at this carefully and understand what's happening under the water, it is anything but calm. It is everything uh, from, uh, it's two massive violent forces colliding with one another and trying to win a battle. That's what's happening every time there's a tidal change. And when it happens, there is kind of this, what we call tidal chop that can be very serious if you're in the wrong kind of boat or just out there paddle boarding or something. And isn't that a lot like life? Like, like our life is just filled with this ebb and flow and we pray for the observable slack tide where it looks like, Lord, make it calm. Make it stable. Make it predictable. Because isn't that what faith is supposed to do? When I look at the scriptures and I sing the songs and they're wonderful and beautiful of God's faithfulness and providence and everything that God is to us, especially in the person of Christ, that boy, we long for the slack tide. But actually when there's a slack tide, what's going on under the surface can be chaotic and even violent. And so that's gonna be a metaphor that I'm gonna hold on to for the next couple of nights I'm with you, is we can talk a lot about what it means to be a Christian and the older we get, the older I get, as much as I know and love the scriptures and how God continues to comfort me through his word and by his spirit, there's so much about him that I, I seek to try to figure out and control. I worked for 15 years after college as, on Young Life staff, uh, helping young people to come to faith in Jesus. And then I started teaching seminary at Denver and then at Fuller Seminary. I did that for 26 years of my life. I'm 47 years old. <clears throat> and then I ended up leaving Fuller to go be a pastor. And what I actually have realized, especially during this time, is as I've sought to try to help people to trust Jesus enough to make it through those times of turbulent waters 
and even the slack tides that feel like everything's okay, but maybe not so much in the inside. And I've been doing it so much in my head. I don't know about you, but I do know that most of my life and career has been about the cognitive desire to know God, to receive his word, and to have my life changed so that I can rest assured that I will be with him for eternity. But is that really the journey he has for me? And that's where we're going to be going the next two days. I hope you will hear me not from the head, but from the heart. Because one thing that I've I haven't come to realize, it's not past tense. I'm in the process of learning how much I have to learn. But I've come to recognize that so much of our faith, especially if we've been around a while, can be located in our head and in the slack tide or the perception of that. And I can so easily believe that I am living a biblical life, a, a faithful life of loving Christ and yet, am I really? What is going on in my heart, Lord Jesus? So we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture. And we've been doing that a lot. You guys, you sing a lot and you look at a lot of Scripture and you pray a lot. This is fantastic. I don't know why I'm even here. But it's awesome to be here with you. We have a tradition that I loved at St. Andrews where I was as pastor. That if you're able and if you're not, it's okay, um, but if you're able, I'd like to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word out of Matthew 14, starting at verse 22. As you're standing, let me let you know, remind you of this passage. Jesus had fed, just fed the 5,000, the scriptures tell us men. That doesn't mean women and children don't matter. It happened to be how the Holy Spirit inspired this particular text, but it was thousands of people he had fed. And that's where we pick it up in verse 22 of Matthew 14. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into their boat after he had dismissed the crowd and go on ahead of him to the other side of the lake, where he then dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Some of us know that some traditions say, Thanks be to God. Do you want to say, Thanks be to God? Be That's pretty enthusiastic. You can go ahead and be seated. The scriptures, you know this passage, probably most of you, you have heard it preached on, maybe you've studied it, maybe you've taught on it, and perhaps we're very familiar with it. Let's just walk through some of the words that tell the story. Verse 26 is when they saw Jesus, they were terrified. Some translations actually said troubled, but the original language uses a word that means it's more than troubled, it's literally almost out of my mind. They were so afraid that they didn't understand it. They weren't expecting Jesus to show up. Then Jesus said, verse 27, have courage, grab hold of courage. I am, ego me. 
the image that we know that it's the same language that God used for himself to Moses that Jesus used many times in the book of John. I am, take courage. And then he says, do not be afraid. They were terrified, 26, 27. They were afraid, don't be afraid. Verses 28 and 29. And then Peter says this rather odd thing that I'm sure you've heard a lot. I don't know how much you've actually dug into it and, and played with this a little bit to try to understand it. But Peter does say this odd thing. If it's really you, that's an odd thing. It's okay to read the scriptures and go, at first glance, I don't understand that, Lord. What, what is by your spirit you trying to tell us even tonight? If it's really you, well, what it seems like from the context of this is Peter really did want to believe that it was Jesus. Peter really wanted to be with his Lord. We see it later in the book of John, the upper room, when Peter has this kind of argument with Jesus. Jesus washes his feet. Peter goes, no. And then when they're talking, Peter says, fine, wash all of me. That's Peter's personality. And he says, if it's really you, Lord... I want to be on that water with you. I want to experience a quality of life and experience of faith that I could not apart from you. I'm not really sure it's you. I didn't expect you. But if it's you, I want to be out there with you. And then the Lord simply says, come. And then verse 30, you see what happens. He saw the wind. Then he was afraid. And then he sank. He wanted to be with Jesus, and he asked him to bring him out on that water with him, but then somehow the wind actually convinced him that this was a dumb thing to do. Why, what were you thinking, Peter? Why did you ask for this? And so the wind throws him off, and that caused him again to be afraid. They were terrified. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Then he sees the wind and feels the effects of being out there, realizing I have no ability to do this. This is outside what I should have been doing. Why did I even ask? And he doubted. So what happened is he sank out of his fear. And then verse 31 you have little faith is what the NIV says and your translation probably says something similar, kind of loads it up with four words. It's actually one work in the Greek. The idea of well, you have little faith. You didn't trust me, Peter. You, you did sorta, of. you got out of the boat, but look at your failure. Look at how you disappoint me. Look at what you're doing to the other 11 guys sitting in the boat watching this thing. You have little faith, Peter. I, I've heard this preached so many times with that exact kind of spirit and attitude. What did God think of Peter in this event? So much of the narratives, the stories in the scripture are offered to us so that we can allow ourselves to be drawn into the story that God gives us in the scriptures in order for God to get our attention, not just in our head, but in our heart. The narratives of the scripture have a way of infiltrating all the defenses of how we've created our life and faith, no matter how old we are or young we are, how new or old in the faith we are, we commit ourselves so often to the slack tide of faith. Lord, grant me comfort. Grant me the ability to be right. Help me to identify those who are other than me. Lord, I just want a great life. Comfort, comfort me as Isaiah. You tell Isaiah to comfort, comfort my people. What did God think of Peter? So the question I want to ask you first tonight as we open his word, if you're thinking from the heart, I know in the head, if we had a quiz on this, you'd probably do like most of my students did. You'd get a nice solid B minus. Thank you. Somebody laughed. I really appreciate that. That's a unique thing tonight, but I, thank you. Uh, if I had knowledge of what does God think, not just to Peter, but what does God really think about you right now, tonight, as his follower. How does God feel about you? 
How does God see you as you wake up in the morning and you go about your day, as you write emails and you read, pod, read articles or pod, hear podcasts or watch the news, as you have a conversation with friends over coffee, when you choose to move through your life and decide what's important, who's important, how you live, what does God think? You ever ask yourself that question? I think most of us, the older we get in faith, especially, but all of us, no matter what stage, that's a question we'd rather, would re we'd rather avoid. I know I would. I don't want to go there. Because in those moments when I am honest, when I do bring myself into a spiritual um, place of reflection and open reception to the power and the beauty and the wonder of the spirit to actually ask the Lord, what do you think? How do you feel about how I treated D, my wife, last night? How, what do you think of the way that I spend my time and my resources? Lord, am you pleased with me? I know in my head you love me. I'm the beloved because of your great love, but was God mad at Peter? Let's start there. I got three reasons to tell you no chance. How's that? I gave it away. We ought to close in prayer because it's done. No, it's wrong. Three, three reasons. First of all, Jesus knew Peter better than Peter knew himself. Jesus knew Peter inside out, knew all of his motives, knew all of the things that drove him, things that Peter did not even know. Jesus knew his convictions, he knew his values, he knew his foibles, he knew his brokenness, his history. Peter couldn't hide from Jesus the fact that Jesus gave him a nickname. That word in the Greek is a single word that's a descriptive term, an adjective to describe how far, along, how far along this journey of faith Peter actually is. Little faith. English versions should not put you of little faith. It should say little faith. It's his nickname. It's very appropriate. Peter, I know you. I know exactly what happened. I knew it was going to happen when you said come out here. I, I get it. You are not going to surprise me by your weaknesses, by your excitement, and by your failures. There's no way you can convince me that you're not going to be you in our relationship. So because Jesus knew him so well, there's no way that he would condemn him for being himself with his weak faith. Being himself with this shallow understanding, hey, if I'm going to go out there, I'm going to have the victory of Christ. Watch this, guys. But here comes the wind. Here comes the difficulties. Here comes the loneliness. Here comes the insecurity. Here comes my background. Here comes the things that make me mad. Here comes the things that, that scare me. And seeing the winds out there in the water, realizing there's no chance for me to do, I cannot do this. Little faith, what happened? Second thing is um, notice the theme throughout all this passage and in Luke 5. I just want to remind you in Luke 5, chapter 10, uh, verse 10, as we read tonight and we've been reading it all week, is Jesus says about the, when Peter says, get away from me for I'm a sinful man, Jesus says, don't be afraid. I'm going to take away your fear. Trust me. Don't be afraid. And I'm going to teach you to fish for people. <clears throat> this theme of fear is a primal emotion, and it's the one where we are most easily triggered. You know, most of the time when we're angry, it's coming from a place of fear, depending on how you define that. Most of the time when we find ourselves really thrown off or we find ourselves emotionally upset or we've ruined for the third year in a row Thanksgiving, that's coming from something that we, 
we don't like the title chop. We, we don't like the storm, the tempest that's waging. We, we don't even really trust the calm seas of this thing called slack tide because we know there's so much under the surface. See, this is one thing over these years, and partly I thought I was being a professor, but then when I went into actually being a pastor of a church and I saw it more and more firsthand than I ever had before with students. See, students pay you to want to know what you think. When you write books and you're consulting a speaker or a, or a teacher, everybody likes you. Or if they don't like you, they don't ask you back, but you don't know anyhow. <laughs> but when you're in pastoral ministry, that's not the game necessarily. And one thing you realize is, is especially for believers so often, corporately, and, and the theme of unity is a big one of this one, we can really strive for unity. We can seek the slack tide, the observable slack tide. But it's so hard to go deeper than that because we know it's not as clean. Christianity would have such a greater impact if Christians would come clean. If Christians would somehow recognize before our brethren and the people we seek to reach in Christ's name, if we would just be ordinary, broken people that somehow Christ has pulled us up out of the water. But it's so hard for us. And so what happens is we get stuck. We get so easily stuck. And our fear inhibits our faith. And I, I tell you, there have been, so, there are so many across this country, thousands and thousands of pastors and senior pastors especially that are still reeling from the last three years uh, between the pandemic, the politics, the racial unrest, the violence across the board, all the stuff that is going on and pastors trying to say, here's the word of God, let's at least read it together, let's love one another as we try to figure out, Jesus, where are you in the midst of this cultural issues that we're facing in my own marriage, in my friendships, with my kids, with my grandparents, whatever. But then fear hinders my ability to hold on. And really what Jesus is saying when he says, don't be afraid, he's saying two things I want you not to be afraid of. From the heart, not the head. Two things. One is, don't be afraid of me. I firmly believe that so many evangelical Christians, especially in the Western world, are really afraid to look Jesus square in the eye and bring all of the tempest of life to him. And so we hold on to fear. We hold on to struggle. We continue to have difficulty in relationships. We partition out who we like and who we do not like, who we can love and who we critique. And fear paralyzes our ability to be faithful to Jesus. Little faith, don't be afraid of me. And secondly, don't be afraid of joining me in the midst of the tempest. I believe with my whole heart, if there's any message for those that are desiring to be biblical faithful to Jesus Christ, is that not only are we a little bit afraid of him, he may lead me into waters that I'm afraid of, that I don't agree with, that I don't like, or that I don't know what to do with, but also I'm afraid of what it will mean. I figured out life on the surface. It sure looks like from scriptures and the Psalms especially that as we trust Christ, as we continue to seek him, there's something that happens as we grow older, a deepening of the spirit where not only do we not fear him, but we can't help but be out there in the water with him. And that the spirit is constantly moving his people to say, what's next, Lord? What's next? For Peter, he saw the wind. 
And he got afraid. And he sank. The Lord knew him. Fear inhibited him. Thirdly, though, and here's the kicker. You know why I know that Jesus couldn't have been bad at Peter? Pretty obvious. What did Peter do when he sank? Yes. One of you got it. Way to go. That's a B plus right there. I just love that. Way to go. He called out to Jesus. You know what that means? He didn't swim back to the boat. You ever fall out of a boat in kind of stormy waters? I have twice. And I swam back to the boat. Now, I, Jesus, I didn't see him right there, so I, you know, I didn't have anything to do other than that. But it's a scary thing. But Peter is such a great hero of the faith and a model for us because he didn't swim back to the boat where he was safe and secure and could control what he had counted on his whole life was the boat. The great thing about this passage, I don't really know why the Lord gave us in such stark ability for us to see Peter versus the other 11. There is no way Jesus was mad at Peter because there's 11 guys in the boat who never trusted him enough to get out. If Jesus is upset with anybody, it's the other 11. Because Peter said, Lord, I don't even know what I'm talking about, but I want to be with you. And then in his mind, he failed miserably. And the Lord said, little faith, you got a ways to go. It's coming. Because Peter didn't swim back to the boat. Okay, for you and me, from the heart, this passage of scripture we read, we we just did what's called exegesis. We look carefully at the text. We tried to understand it. I can't get away from being a professor all those years, all right? But as we dive into the text to see what really took place, what really happened, what does this mean for me? It's not an allegory. It's an event. I believe that with my whole heart, but it's an event that teaches me something when I allow myself to realize I every day have a choice. Am I going to trust him and get out of my own comfort? Am I willing to be with him even if it shatters my convictions? Or it forces me to take him seriously in light of all the noise that's around me. It's, it's one thing for us to wave a Christian flag and to say, I'm a believer because I have lived my life following you. It's a whole other thing to actually get out of the boat and trust him as I participate with him in his kingdom work. See, he's on the move. We don't have to beseech Jesus to do anything because the kingdom is now and not yet. It's coming and the king is bringing his kingdom in and the reason he's calling us to himself is that we participate with him in bringing his kingdom in. That's why we pray in the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is what it means for you and me. Pretty simple. So let me give you some examples if you want to know where I'm going with this because the Holy Spirit has to, when you open up your heart to the Holy Spirit, it has nothing to do with me and whether or not I was able to eloquently enough get your attention or not doesn't matter at all. That's the uniqueness of a role like this versus some other kind of convention or conference or teaching situation. This is about the Lord's work with us as his people, individually and corporately. Jesus wants to get your attention tonight. No question about it. Where are you sitting or standing? Is there a place where you know, maybe you're really out there in the water mostly, you give yourself a good grade, but you know, you know, there's that relationship that I have allowed to go south because I just can't get rid of my anger. There is arrogance over people that are different or what I see in the news. 
There is fear and insecurity about all the changes that are going on in culture. There's so much around us that would cause us to say, Lord, I can't. I love you, but don't ask me to go out there and join you. And all he's doing is standing on the water, holding his hand out and say, you love me? Join me. Ezekiel, <clears throat> Ezekiel 36, 26 says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Every believer must face this daily. Where do I have a heart that is calcified? That's stuck, that's hard as rock. I may be wonderful and tender and kind with my coffee group and horrific with people I see in the news. And yet, we can kind of stay on the surface and sing the songs and pray the prayers. I gotta promise you this as best I understand the gospels, Jesus does not give us that option. We follow him or we do not. We hold on to a heart of stone or we allow his spirit to change us, to break our heart so that we are useful in his kingdom. Because that passage, Luke 5, that beautiful passage, don't be afraid. I, I sit in, um, during the pandemic, I used to have these meetings on my porch. We were trying to be protective of people, and I don't know where all you guys were in the weirdness of mass, not mass, you know, where you're going to be, inside, outside. So I, I had a manse, a church house right by the church in Newport Beach, and I had these two great chairs. We were six feet apart outside and a fan kind of blowing sometimes, and so I'd have all my meetings. It was so great because I would do sermons on video, so I, I got great feedback from the two guys videotaping me. So I'd feel really good after most of those sermons on videotape. That was great. But then I'd sit with some people, and this, this one dear, sharp woman, tenured academic professor of psychology in charge of a key portion of our women's ministry, really wonderful, early 70s. She wanted to meet with me, and as soon as she came over to the house and sat up front, did the iced tea thing, and... I could tell that she was a little upset, but she liked me because I'm likable. My kids would tell you maybe different, but they're not here. They're up in the north of Seattle. And so she beat, beat around the bush for about an hour. I'm kind of knowing that she's really mad. Something's wrong. Finally, she gets around to it. And she says, chap, I just, I just got to say it. Good. Tell me. Why do you talk about Jesus so much? I go... Help me here. Um, what are you talking about? That's, yes, that sure seems to be the very center. The Philippians passage, that beautiful song you sang. She said, why don't you talk about God more? I didn't want to dive into theology of, even though, yes, I, of course I wanted to. Colossians 1, that Jesus uh, Christ is the fullness of God had chosen to dwell in him, Colossians 1. The fullness of God, our Trinitarian God, Father, Son, Spirit, dwelt in the one who came. That's Colossians 1. A good Christology lifts up Christ as the, as the lamb. I want to know Jesus, Philippians 3. And I said, because we will never have a heart of flesh unless we fall in love with Jesus enough to drop everything. And I said, what adjective do you put in front of Christians? Describe yourself. I'm a Christian who is, and then she used these adjectives. My friends, if you put an adjective in front of Christian to describe you, you might as well take away the word Christian. If there's any qualifier that you use to describe being a follower of Jesus, it's not biblical. 
because all he says is, believe in the one he has sent, John 6, 28. What's the work of God for us? Believe in the one he has sent. Trust in the one he has sent. So my friends tonight, I, if you're mad, talk to me, it's okay. Talk to Chad and Becca, they're presidents. <laughs> but if you have questions, talk to each other. If you're frustrated, good, talk about it. But I want to invite you to consider, is it possible the Holy Spirit is saying to you, you're not too young, you're not too old, you're not too poor, you're not too rich. There's no reason that the Holy Spirit can't change your heart. Lord, save me, Peter said. Would you pray with me? Father, uh, you know way more than I do that I need to remember this I need to take this on. You also know that everything that I, I see in your word is calling us to this radical, free, honest faith in you. Lord, you are not stuck and you will not allow your church to be stuck. You are calling us to be set free to join you in your kingdom work. May you have at our hearts. May you convict us. May you heal us. May you hold us. Especially for those who are potentially struggling a little bit tonight. May you convince them that you are the God of all comfort. Father of compassion. The great tender one who has come to take us in your arms. That it's not in our work and our merit, it's simply about allowing you to change us. Give each of us hearts of flesh for your sake and of course your glory. Amen, Lord Jesus, come.